I really want to tell you about my favorite story, which has to do with my favorite social entrepreneur in the world, this seven-year-old boy named Dylan. So this story started eight years ago. I got back from my first trip to Uganda and Kenya. I get back from this trip, and a friend of mine calls me up. She's a grade one teacher. Her name's Christina. She says, Taylor, I want to do something really innovative with my kids this year. I don't want them just to fundraise. I want to teach them about charity. I really want them to learn and soak something in. I said, great, well, I'm really passionate about entrepreneurship, more notably social entrepreneurship, so why don't we do this? We'll go to your, we'll go to your class, grade, grade one, six-year-olds, and we'll give them $100, and we'll sit, tell them it's their seed money. And their goal will be to take that, spend that $100 starting a business, and their goal will be to turn that $100 into $500. And that way, they'll learn that, biz, that um, business is a tool for doing social good. She said, great idea, goes back to all the teachers at her school, it ends up having 18 teachers at this elementary school all want to do the same thing. And so I walk in there, is that cool? So, badass teacher. So I walk in there with this like, I thought it would be a good idea to bring a wad of $100 bills into an elementary school. And I'll never forget, you got a picture of like 25 seven-year-olds sitting here, it was a grade two class, the first class I walked into. I'm excited, I'm like, you guys have got $100, what are you gonna do with it? They're like, I'm gonna touch it! <laughs> the, the, the teacher's like, Taylor, whoa, you cannot just walk into a room full of seven-year-olds waving around $100 bills, like, we've got a flip chart. And so she gives me one of those, I don't know if you remember being in grade two, but those little like, squat chairs. <laughs> I'm sitting in this chair, and she opens the flip chart, and it has, you know, in very perfect grade two-year-old teacher, grade two um, teacher writing, it says, like, you know, bake sale, lemonade stand, that kind of thing. Typical kind of businesses you'd start when you're seven years old. And then down in the bottom, with this, like, squiggly seven-year-old writing, it says, Dylan's Plays and Stories. Like, some kid was like... <laughs> <"What's it in?" laughs> puts it in, and, and so I zone in on that and say, what, Dylan, who's Dylan, and what are these plays and stories? This sounds really exciting. And there's this kid, so you picture all the seven-year-olds here, he's sitting separate, he's like the cool kid in class, sitting in the back, and he goes, ugh, that's me. <laughs> he's like, it's a hassle. I said, uh, Dylan, would you tell me about the plays and stories? They sound really cool, man. And he says, fine. Gets up, all the kids are like, oh, Dylan's gonna talk. And he's wearing skinny jeans and a Led Zeppelin t-shirt. <laughs> he's like a seven-year-old hipster. And, and he starts pacing like this, and he says, well, I've written a number of plays and stories. They've all been very successful. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, he says, I've, I've, written, <laughs> I've, written a play for all of, I've written a play for all of the kids to perform, and we'll probably have the money raised in a night. <laughs> and so you gotta picture this. So, Dylan, Dylan, seven years old, he writes this play. They put on a play night. They charge their parents to come watch them. <laughs> Can you imagine that, like, seven-year-old hip, seven-year-old, like, bouncer, like, what's your name? I'm your mother. <laughs> and, and so they, they put on this play night. They, they do it. They, then they sold them pizza and Coke and all the things, and they turned their $100 into $500 in a night. And I didn't, get a, I didn't hear from that school for about two months. And I, I get a call and they said, we're done. We called it the early entrepreneurs experiment. Oh, and by the way, this important piece that I missed is that $1,800 is what we gave out. Their goal was turned into $500 each. So 18 times 500 would be $9,000. And $9,000 is enough to build a schoolhouse for kids just like them that lack access to basic education on the other side of the world in Kenya. So the t telling like it would be a school, building a school was the goal. And so I get this call and I said, well, did you do it? Did you, did you make the $9,000? They said, just come pick up the check, just come to the office. So I go to the office when I'm supposed to go to the office. I, I, they said, you gotta go to the auditorium. I go to the auditorium, 400 kids sitting in the auditorium. And they've got a check, like, you know the publisher's sweepstakes <laughs> under a curtain? And I'm like, I'm hoping that they did it. I mean, how empowering would that be? And they open up this, this curtain, and the check is not made up for $9,000. It's made up for $18,000. <laughs> Thanks. So, And what I, what I, I dissected that, I like to kind of take a scientific approach to any of these random um, fundraising initiatives that I do and think of like what made this work and, and learn as much as I can out of it. And yes, the kids were creative, they were brilliant, they thought outside the box, they didn't have failure as a mindset. Those are all things that six-year-olds and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds don't have or have. But what I learned, what, what struck me the most was that they had this innate sense of empathy, this unimpeded sense of empathy where you told the kids, by the way, there's kids that are just like you on the other side of the world that they don't have a school, and they're like, excuse me? We need to do something about that. We need to put on a play night. So, and, and I love that, that sense of empathy, and, 
that kind of catalyzed a lot of the things that I do now. And what I, what I exist for in this world is to scale empathy. I think empathy heals. And I'm talking about empathy as in oneness, as in sameness, as thinking, not only knowing what someone's feeling, but feeling what they're feeling. And I wasn't as fast in life as Dylan was at finding something that you know, was my calling. It took me a little bit longer. Um, like this guy. That's me eight years ago. <laughs> my favorite pose. And that's strutting around in front of about 400 people in a pair of bright blue man panties. And I'm wearing them right now. And my, my power panties. And, and can you see the tan from there? I don't know if you can see it. Like, you have to lather that thing on at 12 a.m., 2 a.m., 4 a.m., and 6 a.m. to get it that dark. And obviously, no one told me I was supposed to put it on my face, too. So, yeah, quite the character. Anyways, I like showing this picture not only because of the panties but, and the little naked man trophy I'm holding, but because this was the epitome or like the pinnacle of my outward search for happiness. This guy existed for one person, and he's on that screen. And after a lot of trying to find fulfillment in all these different places, in money, in relationships, in physical fitness, I decided none of those were working. I was 28 at the time, and I said, I'm going to go on a trip. I'm going to actually start giving. I'm going to change my own life paradigm a little bit. And this generation, a millennial generation, or slightly older than the millennial generation, we are somewhat disillusioned with nonprofits as a, as a whole. And we want to know where our money is going, I find. It's a thing that is, is repetitive in this, in this culture. And so I decided, and I'm stereotypically one of those people, and so I decided I was going to go on a trip, I was going to find a cause that I could really sink my teeth into. And I went on a trip to Uganda, I went to Kenya, I checked out a whole bunch of different nonprofits. This is the first one, uh, or this is the first village that we visited. And this is on the, on the border of the Congo, in, in the Renzori mountain range. And I remember getting up to the top of this, this, uh, this mountainside and saying to my guide, I said, this place is incredible, it's beautiful, I love it. It's, it there's so many kids, where are their parents? My guide looks at me and says, well, Taylor, 70% uh, of this village has AIDS. Their parents are dead. And that's when the trip went from being this adventure, this thing where I'm going to find something that I want to find fulfillment out of, to being the most transformational experience of my life, and the biggest, I guess you could say, empathy builder of my life as well. Because when I met these two girls, something happened in my brain or my heart or my mind or my soul, however you want to say it, that these walls kind of came crumbling down in my head of this separateness of I'm different than people living in Uganda or people living in Mexico or people living in Guatemala or Sierra Leone or wherever it is. All these walls came come tumbling down and I literally felt like I felt what they were feeling. And knowing what their life trajectory was like, it made it completely impossible to do anything but contribute to ideally making their life a little bit happier. So I decided I would start with one thing. I would get home to Western Canada, and my goal was to raise enough money to build a schoolhouse for kids like this. I knew it would cost about $10,000 to do. So I looked into crowdfunding. I thought, OK, I'll just get a whole bunch of people to give $20. Then I did some quick math. I would have to get 500 people to give $20 to raise $10,000. I don't have that many friends. And, and so I decided I'd come up with this equation, something a bit different, and it goes like this. 33 people giving $3.33 a day for three months adds up to $10,000. So a group of people, like this tiny section of people here that are sleeping right now on the beanbags, um, <laughs> wake up! Uh, giving the price of a cup of coffee a day for three months adds up to enough to build a schoolhouse for kids that will educate roughly 1,000 kids over the, next 20, or over the next 20 years, which is mind-blowing to me. And so I set this goal, and I didn't want to do the cold crowdfunding thing. Well, kind of crowdfunding, but I did this equation. I made a little website um, like this, and I sent it out to my 33 friends, each a personal video to each one of them. And the video that would play would say, like, let's say I was sending this to Vision. It would say, hey, Vision, really excited about this. We're going to build a school in Kenya. Watch this video. It's going to tell you everything you need to know. Then this animated video would come on, because you know Vision's going to have questions. And it says, hundreds and hundreds of kids are going to get educated. You're going to get a Facebook cover photo to show everything that you've done. You're going to get a tax receipt, Vision, because I know you do your taxes. It's going to say that it's the price of a cup of coffee or a slice of pizza or parking downtown for two hours. It's less than the tip that you would leave at a restaurant. And if you give this 333 a day, your mom's going to be really proud of you. <laughs> so send that out to my friends. Really like hacked together this, this site on YouTube and Dropbox and whatnot. Sent it out and all my friends gave. We raised $10,000 in 24 hours, which blew my mind. And then I'm guessing, like, the, I love talking to rooms like this because we're all the same way. We're thinking, well, what if you had 10 people do it? Then if 10,000 people do it. So you, you get that vibe, right? And so I had a friend of mine do it. He raised $10,000 in 24 hours. Another friend, another friend, another friend, 10 people do it. We ended up funding 150 schools 
all this exact same way. Thanks. All, all the same way with $3.33 a day for three months. And in total, we had 16,000 people from 80 countries all over the world give $3.33 a day for three months, funded 400 projects in 14 countries, and we scaled. We had like schools, libraries, water projects, girls' scholarships, anti-sex trafficking work, homelessness initiatives, veterans' rehabilitation, you name it, all under this, this idea of giving $3.33 a day for three months. But what blew my mind, and I'm talking fast because the timer's going fast, is <laughs> what people were feeling after these campaigns was a deeper sense of empathy. They're feeling similar to what I felt when I went on my first trip to Uganda and Kenya. And I started thinking, is it possible to scale this? Is it possible to scale that? Not just fundraising, but that feeling. Can I give someone such a crazy, visceral experience that they are a different person when they come home? And the number one question that we had asked by those 16,000 people was, can I go see the project? Can I go see the school? Can I go see the home? Can I go see the water project? And so we decided to do an experiment and we changed the equation. We changed it to having 10 people give $3.33 a day for three months, which added up to $3,000, enough to build one home for a family living in some conditions throughout Latin America. So we partner, we're a for-profit company, we partner with a nonprofit that's been around for 20 years. They build 100,000 of these homes, they're prefabricated, they go up in two days. And we decided that we'd say, yes, you can go and build the home. If you raise $3,000, you can go and build the home in person, yourself, with the family that's gonna be living in it. So what we'll do is we'll land on Friday, I'll stay over Friday night at a hotel, then we'll go uh, Saturday morning, Nicaraguan coffee on our hands, we'll go build with the family that's going to be living in the home, meeting the kids, learning about them, and learning their stories. Like this woman, this young woman here, and these, these homes are built for, you know, the gamut, they're built for the most in need people. There's a thousand point analysis that the nonprofit does on every single family in these communities to make sure that the homes are going to the person, with the most, person or the family with the most need. Like this young woman on the right, uh, her name's Yorling, she's 18 and she's pregnant and currently, well, prior to her receiving a home, was sleeping on the ground in her mother's home, which was made of tarps and two-by-fours. And on the left is Angela, who helped her build her home. This is what happens on the second day of, of our build trip. So you build all day Saturday, build all day Sunday. At the end of the day on Sunday, if we all work our butts off, the house is done, we have a ribbon-cutting ceremony, and those hands belong to a 95-year-old man named Senor Rodriguez. And Senor, Senor Rodriguez has never had a brand new home. He's been on the earth for almost a century. And I would love to tell you how he felt, but I think this does a better job. I was about 20 feet away from, from this moment happening, falling my head off like every time. And, and watching Marlon, 40-year-old nightclub producer who built Senor Rodriguez's home, who raised enough money to build Senor Rodriguez's home, built it alongside him. I'm watching Marlon have that moment that I had, watching him cry and knowing that he'll never be able to go back from that moment. And I'm watching empathy be created in someone that already had empathy, of course, but maybe it's be, you know, going from a two to a 10 or a three to a seven or something like that. And, and it was a beautiful moment. And so after this, we go to the beach, we do surfing, we bring amazing yoga teachers, we do three days on the beach. Um, this is Danielle Rosati from New York, an incredible yoga teacher. And we do meditation, but most of all, we create community around this thought of shared empathy. Every single trip, I feel all these feelings, I feel shame, I feel guilt, I feel depressed, I feel hope, I feel optimism, I feel the ability to make massive change. That rainbow of feelings, in my mind, leads to the most beautiful, world-changing emotion in my mind or, or state, which is empathy. Because I believe that a world where we truly all genuinely feel empathetic, where we feel like we're the same as every single other human being on this earth, is a world that legitimately could not have war. It's a world that would not have gender inequality. It's a world that would not have poverty. It's a world that I know that I'm, that I'm here to help create. And the reason I'm standing right here is because I want to create that world with every single one of you. Thank you.